On the 23rd of April, 2019, an extraordinary journey began. Myself, my mum, Abriel Rai and Pasung Sherpa embarked on an adventure to the west coal of Burundi, a formidable 7,000 metre peak in the Himalayan region of Nepal. Our goal was clear. The summit was beyond our reach due to many factors. The risk of avalanche and crevasse danger was high and our team didn't have the manpower to fix ropes to the summit. Burundi is known to be a challenging mountain that many experienced mountaineers take more than one attempt to summit. But we were determined to trek to Camp One. As we trekked to the base of a 210 metre, 45 degree vertical wall of rock, snow and ice, I found myself in tears. The realisation that the summit was improbable weighed really heavy on my heart. We had spent weeks in the mountains at a base camp and the isolation was taking its toll on me. My mum had lost her voice. Our two porters did not speak English. I was just 16 years old and I was on my period. <laughs> In the predominantly male world of mountaineering, I felt myself teetering on the brink of insanity. But as I sat at that base of the icy wall, wiping my tears while devouring my pancakes from my packed lunch, Pasung Sherpa sat me down for a heart to heart. He told me something which still resonates deep within me today. He said, embrace the experience of being with the mountains and enjoying the climb despite the destination. Not all summits are guaranteed, but you will learn something new on every climb. As Sherpa, we don't take risks with our clients' lives or our own lives just for a summit. We feel every part of the journey is as important as arriving at that summit. Life is most important. That simple yet profound message changed my perspective on climbing. My journey to the Himalayas began in 2018 when I was just 14 years old. It was a transformative moment inspired by a conversation with my dad about my dreams of one day summiting Mount Everest. My mum and I trekked to Everest Base Camp and it marked the start of a series of expeditions ascending to higher altitudes gradually in preparation for our Everest expedition, which was planned for May 2020, when I would be just 17 years old. However, a week before our departure, the world changed and the mountain was closed. Our expedition was postponed due to the unforeseen arrival of COVID-19. After completing my final year of high school, Mum and I embarked on our Everest expedition finally. And on the 14th of May, 2022, we stood atop the world together on the summit of Everest. But we were not alone. We stood together with our climbing guides, Tendi Sherpa and Pasung Sherpa, and our team, Kasung Tamung Sherpa, Namgal Tamung Sherpa, and Lafka Sherpa. It is with immense pride and gratitude that I stand before you today, not just to share my climbing journey, but more importantly, to shine a brighter light on the Sherpa community. These extraordinary people who often labour in the shadows are essential to the world of mountaineering. But who are Sherpa? It's often lost on people who Sherpa actually are. They're an ethnic group, estimated to have a population of about 55,000. And Sherpa is the word for the ethnic group and also their family name, with women referred to as Sherpani. You can dissect the word Sherpa to decipher its meaning. Pa, meaning people, and Sher from the east. Originally hailing from the east of Tibet, the Sherpa migrated into the valleys of Nepal over 500 years ago. The reason for their migration is difficult to confirm as there's limited written evidence, but their legacy in the mountains is undeniable. In the 1920s, as expeditions gained popularity in the Himalayas, the Sherpa community's extraordinary strength and endurance became recognised. They could carry heavier loads and breathe more easily at higher altitudes. It's in their DNA. Born above 3,000 metres, their mitochondria, which is commonly referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, are more efficient, which allows them to use oxygen to create energy more efficiently. And research has now also shown that in Westerners or Lowlanders, after two months at high altitude, our phosphocreatine levels crash, while the Sherpa's actually increases. And phosphocreatine 
provides quick bursts of energy when oxygen levels are low or when your ATP stores are depleted during strenuous exercise. So for climbing at high altitudes where oxygen is very scarce, this phosphocreatine is essential for maintaining that muscle function and strength. This combination of efficient oxygen utilisation and increased energy production and phosphocreatine buffering enables Sherpa to sustain physical exertion for longer periods at higher altitudes, making them so well suited for the challenges of high altitude mountaineering. Trust me, there is no shortage of science behind the amazing physiology of Sherpa. I remember when I was climbing through the Kumbu Icefall with Tendi, my guide, we were ascending up a 10 metre chimney, which is a vertical opening in the face of an ice wall. I had my hands above my head for the length of the climb, allowing, nearly, allowing time for nearly all the blood to drain from my fingertips. This combined with my hands pushing through the snow was just enough for my fingers to freeze in pain on what felt like the brink of frostbite. Tendi advised me calmly to put my fingers underneath my armpits to warm them up. While chuckling, he says, my fingers never get cold. The mountains truly are their home, their playground and their birthright. The Sherpa community's global recognition came when Tenzin Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary successfully summited Everest in 1953. Up until then, it was typical for Sherpa to work as porters, carrying loads up the mountain, setting up camps, and serving as part of kitchen teams. The successful Everest ascent not only brought global recognition to the Sherpa, but it led initiatives aimed to uplift the community and the Kumbu region. Hillary devoted so much of his life following his ascent of Everest to helping the people of Nepal. The work Hillary has done has provided Sherpa with educational opportunities for children and fostered the growth of their communities. Sherpa began to receive training as expert mountain guides, enhancing their skills and expertise. Sherpa's invaluable contribution extends beyond their physical strength to include guiding climbers, sharing their knowledge of the terrain and ensuring the safety of those who venture into the Himalayas. The Sherpa legacy continues to evolve as they play an increasingly significant role in shaping the future of mountaineering, not just representing a vital support system, but also the embodiment of strength and leadership amongst the world's most challenging environments. This is Pasung Sherpa, the same Pasung from my opening story. Mum and I have known Pasung since 2019 and have climbed with him ever since including our 2019 autumn expedition of Choyu, the sixth highest peak in the world, standing at 8,200 metres. Pasung summited Choyu twice on this expedition. On the 23rd of September, he joined the line fixing team to the summit. Two days later, off only one night's sleep, he summited Choyu again. Not only did he have to find the energy to get himself to the summit, he had to climb at my mum's climbing pace, not his own. He always had to ensure she was safe, warm, fixed to the lines, hydrated and fed. She, he had to make sure she was warm enough, but not too hot, while climbing through torchlight along 40 other climbers, passing and being passed, which meant unclipping from those fixed lines, which are your lifeline. On the descent, he was so exhausted, he sat down, he then lay down. He asked my mum to proceed back to camp without, her, without him so he could rest. But my mum wouldn't leave since he had gone above and beyond what you would expect anybody to ever do for you, for her to achieve her goal. She waited and they climbed down to camp two together. And this is just a normal day in the office for the Sherpa. But beyond their physical prowess, what can we learn from the Sherpa community? While we admire their strength and endurance, there's so much more to be understood from their attitude, connection, and respect for the mountains. This is Tendi Sherpa. He guided me to the summit of Everest and Lhotse last year. Tendi is not only a skilled mountaineer, but he is a loving father and husband, a devoted friend, and a kind and spiritual man. I spoke with Tendi in preparation for my talk today. 
we spoke about his connection with the mountains. I asked why he thinks he's always so happy, and he replied, I think it's because of the mountains. In the mountains, my mind is not disturbed. I do not feel the pressure of everyday life or the busyness of the city. Their distractions fade away, leaving me with a singular purpose to savour every precious moment. We continued to speak of this idea of stillness of the mind and shifting your focus purely to the mountains. His wisdom and insight truly transformed my journey. On our first venture into the Kundu Icefall, my mum was feeling emotionally and physically overwhelmed and Tendi shared a beautiful perspective with her, telling her to put her sadness into the clouds. He said that when your sadness is in the clouds, it will be blown away like a cloud itself and you won't see it in the same way again. This philosophy of presence and connection with the mountains resonated with me throughout the expedition. You can't afford to bring external emotions into the mountains and it's the one place I've always found I can remove myself from the mundane stress and emotions of life and feel present. This practice of mindfulness in the mountains, a tradition passed down by Tendi and the Sherpa community through generations of working in the rugged environment of the Himalayas, was a concept I wholeheartedly incorporated into my own climbing journey. Learning the principles of presence and mindfulness while climbing transformed my relationship with the peaks. I found myself connecting with the snow underfoot, paying close attention to the way my crampons would break through the icy surface. I was acutely aware of every breath, feeling it travel down my throat and fill my lungs, providing energy to my body. This sense of presence and mindfulness has deepened my connection with the mountains, making each ascent a meaningful experience. And it's a tranquility I will always cherish. As I draw my presentation to a close, I want to share two images with you all. On the left, is Pasung Sherpa peeking into my tent at the top of that treacherous icy wall I mentioned earlier. And on the right is Tendi Sherpa at Camp One on Everest. These two photos were taken exactly three years apart and I feel like they encapsulate what I've spoken about today so perfectly. All the Sherpa I've been lucky enough to not only climb under the guidance of, but be friends with, go above and beyond what should be humanly possible to take care of myself and all the other climbers in the Himalayas. With the most delightful and contagious smiles on their faces the entire time. I'm tucked into my sleeping bag while taking both of these photos, trying to warm myself from the strenuous day I'd just had. Every day I've spent on a, in a tent on the mountain so far. Their smiley, fun-loving, childlike silliness has never failed to bring me that pick-me-up, which I needed. When I was trying to think of one word to perfectly describe the Sherpa, the word which instantly came to my mind was warmth. It's a quality that seems to exude from them. Amidst the relentless cold, where temperatures drop far below freezing, and the vast expanse of the mountains, you'd imagine would make one feel profoundly insignificant and isolated. Yet their unwavering warmth provides so much comfort. I can conclude that my journey in the mountaineering world thus far would not have been the same without the company of the Sherpa. I'm eternally grateful for the Sherpa community and my Sherpa friends for all that they have taught me, the laughs they have provided and the love and kindness that they emanate. Thank you. <laughs>